Dunkirk is a 2017 cinematic masterpiece written and directed by Christopher Nolan. It follows the pending disaster and subsequent evacuation of 340,000 British and Allied soldiers from the beaches of Dunkirk between the 26th of May and the 4th of June 1940. A large part of the success of the evacuation was due to the involvement of around 700 small civilian boats who were able to evacuate troops directly from the beaches due to their low draft and were skippered largely by their civilian owners and volunteers. Nolan explains that society needs these stories to come back to, to remind us of what can be done in the face of seemingly insurmountable odds. One of the key aims of telling the story was to put the viewer in the mind of those involved. Film formats were discussed between director of photography Hoyt van Hoytema and Nolan and the IMAX format was chosen due to its incredible immersive quality of the image. The IMAX format brought with it several hurdles. The IMAX camera is incredibly heavy and cumbersome and the story required the camera to be shoulder mounted for the ultimate realism. Hoyt states that it was worth the physical struggles to pay honour to the original story. The story is told from three perspectives, land, sea and air, each from within its own time frame. The land action is told over the period of a week, the sea action within the period of a day and the aerial action over the period of one hour. The movie is intercut between the three storylines in a way to keep the tension building with the parallel action creating a snowball effect of tension. As one storyline is peaking in intensity, another storyline is gradually building with the climax occurring when all three stories collide. The use of very ground level first person perspectives was vital in creating the suspense in the film. We are always close to the characters and are never fed with the bigger picture, keeping a certain amount of confusion and uncertainty throughout. What is interesting is that the story jumps backwards and forwards, but the anxiety keeps progressing and there is an illusion of the story always moving forward. As your emotions are built up in certain scenes, that same heightened emotion is then transferred onto the following scene from a different part of the story and the intensity keeps building. Interestingly, the same moments that we used to reassure us earlier on in the film are then used as sources of anxiety later on, as our perspective has changed. There is a point where the Spitfire is shot down and the pilot is seen waving, as if OK. But later on, when the suspense has built, we realise he was waving because he was trapped in his cockpit. Dunkirk's editor, Lee Smith, describes that during the editing process, even though the stories were intercut, they found that the best version came when each of the three timelines worked together as cuts on their own. The constant battle during the edit was keeping the overall timeline emotionally accessible, with the emotional peak of the little ships arriving having the maximum impact at just the right moment. Once the day's filming was complete, the film was shipped to Photochem in LA where the camera original negative is processed. A 35mm reduction print was then made and sent back to the set for the directors to view. Dailies were viewed on film in a makeshift theatre. The reduction print was then sent to Warner Brothers and Avid Files created for editing. After the edit was complete, a cut list was created and the original film spliced and a print made from the cut negative. Using the timer, the director and DOP determine what corrections are made before the final prints are produced. Nolan wanted to avoid digital colouring tools and achieved his personal aesthetic vision by restricting the colour treatment to the limited tools of the traditional photochemical colour timing process. A lot of work was put into the production design to create the colour palette captured in camera. Nolan uses colour to signify if an area is safe or unsafe. During the beach scenes at Dunkirk, the colour has a deliberately cold and analogue feel. During scenes depicting England, the palette changes to a vibrant, warm tint, signifying that the location is safe and inviting. A majority of the film has a deliberately muted colour palette to match the subject matter. Colours of the uniforms are largely dictated by history, but as the civilians entered the movie, split complementary colours depicting a change and hope were introduced. 
Peter and George's sweaters had a lot of red in them and George's tank top deliberately contained red, yellow and green. Red sails were also used in scenes with the little ships, contrasting with the blue, green skies and the sea. The digital release of the film was created over three months by colourist Walter Volpato, where the nuances of the photochemical process were faithfully recreated. Visual effects for Dunkirk were handled by Andrew Jackson of Double Negative. For this film, Nolan wanted to create as much in-camera as possible. Jackson studied hours of footage from actual World War II dogfights and created previs mock-ups as a reference. These scenes were then condensed onto a single page drawing. Jackson would then take these drawings up in the camera helicopter or plane and reference for shooting. Visual effects were mainly composited from real footage and footage shot from miniatures combined with smoke and particle elements. Smoke stacks were largely filmed with the IMAX camera and composited. Cardboard cutouts were used for many of the crowd scenes interdispersed with real soldiers. Aerial shots of the beach were enhanced with crowd simulation software to give the viewer a sense of scale. The sound design for Dunkirk is particularly spectacular. It is known to be loud and unrelenting. The film contains a minimal amount of dialogue, leaving lots of space for sound design. Chris Nolan likes to leave the audience to figure out a bigger picture of what is going on rather than get caught up in the small story details. The emotional roller coaster of this type of film is a sum of all the parts and sound plays a big part. Production audio was a major part of the movie and Chris wanted as much audio captured during the filming as possible. This led to very real problems with wind and seawater in the equipment, plus the noise from the IMAX cameras. Dialogue was largely recorded on set with minimal ADR being used. Most ADR sessions included large groups for the scenes involving large numbers of troops. Foley was used extensively in areas where the IMAX cameras were proving to be too noisy. Sounds of the aircraft and boats were all recorded over the filming period and the Stuka sirens were rebuilt and recorded to authentically capture the sound of these aircraft. Chris had noted that after going up in a training aircraft, it was very noisy and vibrates a lot. The pilot's dialogue was recorded in the masks using lav mics and was recorded complete with the vibrations for fantastic realism. The whole sound design for the film was built around realism and those working on the film used full use of the dynamic range to build intensity that worked hand in hand with the interwoven stories being told. From the loud dramatic scenes to the quieter pauses, the whole film is intentionally orchestrated to pull the senses and emotions to the maximum. In Dunkirk, the sound designers meticulously created the sounds that the characters are hearing, whilst the composer Hans Zimmer created the soundtrack heard by the audience to enhance the experience. There's a very close relationship between Hans Zimmer's music score and the rest of the sound design. The soundtrack is largely orchestral and keyboard based. Hans also likes to use organic objects and includes real sounds from the film in his score. His compositions contain samples of boots walking down the streets and across sand, which were all captured on set. To add suspense at certain moments during the film, Hans also uses the sound of a ticking clock created from a watch that Christopher Nolan owns. The score builds a world around the visuals and other sound design. It interweaves music and sound to enhance the emotional dynamic of the film. To keep the suspense building in several places, Hans used a musical technique called a shepherd tone. This gives the listener an illusion that the music is constantly rising in pitch, although it never actually reaches the top. Another favourite of Hans Zimmer's is the use of throbbing bass components that deeply interact with the listener, creating a very palpable physical reaction. The final scene of the film is immensely emotive as the Spitfire flies over the beaches accompanied by a beautiful orchestral soundtrack. We have seemingly left the conflict behind and are emotionally feeling quite battered. The timelines have now departed as the troops are now arriving by train in Woking. George's photo has been printed in the local paper and the Spitfire stands on the beach. For me, this film is a masterpiece in filmmaking, editing and post-production and always brings a tear to my eye. <laughs>